Hello and welcome to this historical overview of living memories of religious communities in Australia. I just want to share my screen um, because we'll move fairly quickly and this might help. I couldn't resist uh, opening with the remark from the typescript of one famous monastic author that nuns are more important than adjectives. In this talk about the contribution of religious life to the church and the mission in Australia and how that's changed over time through the 19th and 20th centuries and onwards, this idea that nuns are more important than adjectives is appropriate in a few ways. You'll notice that there's a claim about power and significance here. One category is more important than another. Perhaps uh, more influential nuns versus adjectives. The history of religious life is certainly also a story about how power is exercised and how decisions are made and about what's given authority, what's given priority. So I want to explore this in the context of the Australian colonies too. Then in terms of sheer numbers, the story of religious life in Australia is a women's story. Nuns consistently outnumber vowed religious men here as well as globally. And we'll see through the decades and especially from the 1880s to the 1960s for every man making religious vows in Australia there have been 10 women. So I want to touch on what that preponderance of women in vowed communities means for us. And then in terms of the style of Australian religious life, this is a practical story. The account the communities give of themselves doesn't often feature long flowery descriptions. Religious life in Australia has been about getting on with it, about getting things done, attending to needs, supporting the people, and also building infrastructure and the institutional life of the church. Nuns are more important than adjectives. I'll look briefly at how that practicality shapes our understanding of mission and the kinds of conversations that we have about religious life and faith in this country. And finally, perhaps you'll notice that the phrase itself needs a second look. It's uh, curiously related to what Pope Francis has said frequently, not so much nuns, but nouns. Nouns are more important than adjectives. That the reality of who someone or something is needs more attention than the way they might be characterized. So it resonates with the questions of practicality that I want to discuss. And it's also true that the title started out as a typo, a slip, a mistake. The famous monastic author really just intended to quote Pope Francis. And I think it's a slip that deserves to be happily remembered. So a fourth reason for enshrining it as a title is because intentional religious communities, both apostolic and contemplative, with various forms of commitment, permanent, temporary, across denominations, also all deserve a second look. I want to suggest that the way we understand the life of the churches in Australia changes when we consider the full and complex stories of religious congregations. So to my first point, there are three broad sections in what, what follows. We'll touch on religious life in Australia as involving living memories of women, of power and priorities, and of a concern with practicalities. And all three areas indicate that the memories need careful attention. So the connection between European Australia and religious communities goes back before British colonisation. In 1630, an Italian Jesuit, Cristoforo Bori, 
advocated for an expedition to the west coast of what was called then Terra Australis, mostly to test out navigational instruments that he'd developed after time at the Jesuit missions in Macau and Goa. Then in 1681, the Vatican Committee for Evangelization of Peoples appointed an Italian Dominican, Vittorio Riccio, who was in the Philippines to lead a missionary effort. Nothing came of these plans, but it's a really clear sign that the assumption of an empty land, terra nullius, was not in play. Everyone knew that there were people here. Awareness of Aboriginal peoples has marked Australian religious life. It was 40 years after the British penal colony was established at Botany Bay that there was an official Catholic presence uh, endorsed and Rome sent well-educated English Benedictines, not the rabble-rousing Irish, to mix with the British administrators. But the early Benedictines, William Ullathorne and John Bede Polding, were very clear-eyed about the dispossession that was going on around them. Polding wrote to the Catholic community in uh, Lent in 1849, reminding them that the First Peoples had a prior claim to the country. You can see uh, what he said on the slide, and I'll, read, I'll leave you to read that. One of the things um, through the 19th and into the 20th century that's especially notable is how often non-English speaking European religious communities made an early and consistent commitment to involvement with First Nations peoples. You know, think of the German Moravians, uh, Italian and German Palatines, Spanish Benedictines. Historians and indeed commentators at the time <clears throat> pointed to the significance of community and stability in making that commitment possible. Rosendo Salvado in the West uh, had a remarkable ministry of 54 years sustained by international networks of religious community that enabled the mission uh, at New Norcia to model something in the 19th century that was quite unusual. The other factor that influenced uh, this European presence of communities in First Nations missions is that the fluent English speakers were in demand in the ministries to the colonists, and especially after the Education Acts between 1870 and 1894 that were passed across all of the Australian colonies, especially after those, act, those Education Acts galvanised the Catholic bishops to expand and staff a separate network of schools. Um, English speakers were really important in the cities to counter the existential threat that um, the Catholic community saw in secular education of the government schools. And this is where the story of religious communities in Australia gathers serious momentum and becomes a women's story. Not that women were not involved in the missionary efforts uh, to the um, Aboriginal peoples, um, but the, the momentum really shifts uh, from uh, the 1880s onwards. So what are these living memories of women to bear in mind? The perceived need for Catholic schooling in Australia was sustained by the voluntary labour of religious congregations, especially groups from Ireland, and communities of women undertook most of the work. Before 1860, there were 24 different communities of Catholic religious in Australia, already important in schools and hospitals and support for women and children. And then in the decade of the Education Acts, 37 new groups arrived with additional increases decade by decade, so that there were 168 groups by 1950. After that, things taper off, but don't disappear. Over 85% of this cohort of church workers uh, who arrived especially for the schooling effort were women. And the sheer number of religious sisters grew almost 14 fold from 18, 8, 815 in 1880 to 11,245 in 1950. 
and the chart on the slide shows the increase, you can see the blue line for women is very close to the yellow line for the total. Internationally, there were many foundations through the 19th century responding to social conditions as Europe industrialised and in the wake of imperial expansion and the spread of the Irish diaspora and Australia's part of that story. The stories of women in schools and hospitals are not disconnected from the memories of power and authority and decision making, of course. We know that women in leadership clashed with the bishops relatively often. We also know that they exercised authority and influence in their own right, modelling a different vocation to marriage and motherhood for generations of women. Mary McKillop, who you can see on the screen, is probably the best known, but there are foundresses in local congregations, others in Australia, and each of the women who led the first arrivals from the groups uh, that were established overseas brings another variation on the theme of uh, commitment and service. The apostolic congregations, the active communities of teachers and nurses made an unparalleled contribution to the life of the institutional church. And also institutionally, the nursing and teaching communities were central to how Australian Catholics understood themselves. So there's that um, dialogue as the institution is um, forming here. The women's communities were charged as the speakers at the National Conference on Catholic Education in Adelaide noted in 1936 with a new crusade. The women of the teaching orders were often called an army and they were charged with delivering a full curriculum and especially with communicating a Catholic faith. In local parish life, the convent was a hub for community building and for cultural expression. Uh, annual fundraising fates, music lessons to support uh, the wider work and choral singing to support the liturgy are all things that feature in the memories of um, the women in the uh, schools and parish communities. While Anglican and Catholic women religious made a permanent commitment, a life commitment, there were communities in Australia in other denominations in the 19th and 20th century who also read the signs of the times and re responded with dedicated service for a period of the time. The Methodist Sisters of the People are one example. With a social out outreach of English Methodism's forward movement in mind, the leaders at the Central Methodist Mission in Sydney and then in Perth invited participation in the 1890s of women who felt called by God to this special work of nursing and social support. Like the Sisters of Mercy, their tent hospitals nursed typhoid pa patients on the West Australian gold fields. And as the comment on Sister Hannah in Melbourne suggests, it, the movement um, spread to all the major um, central missions, Hannah was in Melbourne and um, you can see there uh, the way in which her presence uh, was vital to the work of the mission as indeed the Sisters of the People were vital to the work in um, ports and cities around the country. Some women spent a few years uh, in the community and left to marry, some uh, remained for life and others like Hannah retired exhausted after about 20 years. One of the wider themes in the histories of religious life in all its forms is the capacity to read and respond to the signs of the times. There are qualities of discernment and the capacity to innovate that the liveliest communities have in common right through their history. Although the exponential growth of apostolic congregations slowed significantly after the Second World War and became a trickle after the Second Vatican Council, the innovation continued. For example, I'd argue that it was Catholic sisters involved in catechetics and in redesigning the religious education curriculum from the late 1950s onwards that both anticipated and then rolled out much of the theology and spirit of the Second Vatican Council. And as the visibility of the active congregations diminished, uh, the vitality of their sense of call to the margins and to new ministries 
in parishes, in spiritual direction, in chaplaincies of various kinds, only increased. As the institutional work of schools and hospitals was supported by state aid and lay staff could be paid living wages, the traditional religious congregations um, found that the, the intensity of the work in those uh, traditional congregations founded in the 19th century decreased. There's a tension, I think, as these communities consider their ongoing life together. It relates to the third theme I want to touch on about living memories of practicality. So practical activist organisational capacity is immensely valued in Australia and in the Australian religious scene. That's not to say that we don't have our share of mystics and scholars and poets, but we don't celebrate them in the same way as we honour and remember the builders and the preachers and the teachers and the caregivers. So there's more to say about the ways in which work and prayer or the, work, the wider horizon of spiritual purpose have always been linked about how apostolic life and contemplative life have always spoken to each other in the lives of individual men and women who were committed to these communities. The philosopher Michel Foucault and his arguing partner Pierre Hadot can offer insight here, I think. Foucault has directed attention to ancient philosophical schools whose ideas promoted particular disciplines of the body. And Hadot adds that the bodily dimension of the history of ideas also surely applies to religious communities. Religious life is not a set of beliefs that are assented to, but a set of practices that are embodied. Religious community is enacted. It's a way of life that's followed or not followed. The practices of the community, its work, create the monastic self or the apostolic self, or simply called into being the called and faithful self. The purpose of the work is not production of one sort or another, as significant as providing education or hospitals or an effective laundry or any of the other things that communities do might be. The purpose of the work is not production, but rather to enable people to take their places in a com committed community. And I think that comes into focus for Australian communities, especially from the 1980s. And as we gear up to look more closely at this way of life, there are a myriad of stories that deserve a second look. <laughs> 